I'm Roy Lee Lindsay with the North Carolina Pork Council, and I want everyone to remember, bacon makes everything better. Welcome back to another edition of the David Glenn Show here on the North Carolina Sports Network. I am Mike Waddell. He is David Glenn. And we're talking about bacon and baseball, bacon and basketball. Man, it has been such a great couple of months right here as our subscriber numbers go up, just like our hunger goes up for North Carolina pork products. And I tell you, I'm looking forward to a busy summer of being out on the barbecue, David. I've recently relocated to the Charlotte Metro, and I'm looking forward to finding a new butcher shop where I can go out and get some great pork chops, maybe uh, a nice big pork butt, or even some bacon, because as Roy Lee Lindsay says at the top of every one of our episodes, bacon makes everything better. And it's hard to believe that either basketball or baseball could get any better here in the bold North State. It's been quite a year. No doubt about it. I mean, we had our bacon and baseball event at UNC Wilmington. Shout out to all our friends in Seahawk country. Uh, Bob Hubbard, our friend from the original Saltworks. Jimmy Galise, our friend from both Jimmy's Bar in Wrightsville Beach and also King Neptune Restaurant right there next door uh, by the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, those guys are not only great supporters of ours and great sponsors of ours, they know how to cook. Uh, and they know how to cook a lot of different pork products. So I'm a bacon fan. I'm a barbecue fan of multiple types. I'll have a hot dog around July 4th. Uh, there's really no doubt that bacon does make everything better. And that to me is a, a 12 month a year message. It sure is. We have the North Carolina Sports Awards, the first ever Pioneers coming up on Wednesday, July 10th at 6 p.m. right here exclusively on the North Carolina Sports Network. We're going to talk about all of the great things that have gone on in the sports world here in North Carolina from the fall to the winter to here in the spring. And David, oftentimes over your now 38-year career in covering the Atlantic Coast Conference and especially sports here in the bold North State, you referred to North Carolina as the center of the basketball universe. But it seems like right now, especially with the developments of earlier this week, that North Carolina is truly in what could be described as the golden age of college baseball here in North Carolina as well. Yeah, Mike, I'm glad you mentioned basketball in this baseball context of today's show because that allows for a direct analogy that I'll give you right out of the gate here. In the sport of basketball at the college level, thanks to six-time NCAA champion UNC and five-time NCAA champion Duke and two-time NCAA champion NC State and even several other programs, by the way, that have at least reached the Final Four at some point in that sport, the state of North Carolina has been the center of the college basketball universe for a long time. I'd argue since a little bit after that UCLA dynasty ended long, long ago. However, despite that overall brilliance in college basketball, the most teams our state has ever gotten into a single NCAA basketball tournament is six. And even that six number in men's basketball has happened only twice ever. Once in 2002, once in 2018. For context, this year, our state sent seven teams to the NCAA baseball championship. That was the most of any state in the entire country. And of course, UNC and NC State are still standing this week in the Super Regionals as you and I are having this conversation. Last year, by the way, our state sent eight teams to the NCAA baseball championship. And that was the most in the history of our state in the sport of baseball. And a year ago, it was actually Duke and Wake Forest that made the Super Regionals. Year before that, it was UNC and ECU. Year before that, it was ECU and NC State in the Super Regionals. That shows a lot of quality baseball here in North Carolina by one standard. Again, even more entries than we get in men's basketball. That shows the depth here. That shows the variety here. And back to that basketball analogy, the bottom line is that over these last two years especially, our state 
has been populating the 64-team NCAA baseball bracket with even more teams than we have ever sent, even in our deepest years, to that now 68-team NCAA basketball tournament. To me, that underlines an amazing story unfolding right here in our backyard, and that basketball analogy just emphasizes the very impressive nature of how our state has also become one of the best baseball states in the entire country, too. You mentioned how these last two years have been especially impressive on the college baseball diamond. Now, when you look at the NCAA postseason numbers over these last two seasons, combining last year with this year, how does North Carolina compare with the other states in the union? So let me give some love here to these individual programs as I answer that question. Last year, as I mentioned, our state sent eight teams to the big baseball bracket. And folks can hear that nice variety here. The Campbell Camels, the Charlotte 49ers, Duke, East Carolina, NC State, UNC Chapel Hill, UNC Wilmington, and Wake Forest. Again, that eight last year, the highest number in the history of our state in that postseason event. This year, our state sent seven teams, again, two still standing, seven teams into the big bracket. Six were the same as last year, Duke, ECU, NC State, Carolina, UNCW, Wake Forest. And the seventh this year was High Point University. The Panthers won the Big South Championship in baseball, getting that league's automatic bid to the postseason. And this year was actually the first NCAA tournament bid in the history of High Point University, which has been playing Division I baseball uh, for about 25 years now. Here's what's amazing. Obviously, our two-year bid number, 8 plus 7, equals 15. We can all do that math. But when I did the nationwide research, Mike, over these last two years combined, the second best state had only 10 bids to the NCAA baseball championship. That is just an incredible gap from our 15 to the next best 10. North Carolina with the 15 bids, then the big drop. Louisiana is the one that had 10 bids over these last two years combined. Then it's Texas with nine, California with eight, and both Florida and South Carolina, those states have had seven bid each, bids each, again, uh, when you squeeze these last two years together, and then it's on down the line from there. Uh, but only a couple states are even close to what we have done. And the bottom line is our state has had the most NCAA baseball postseason bids in each of the last two years. No other state is even close. And obviously our teams have been doing some damage lately too. David, it's one thing to get teams into the tournament. It's another one to do some damage when you get there. Now, one of the things, fans, that you have to do is you have to go to our website at ncsportsnetwork.com because not only do you get all of our videos and our podcasts, but you also get exclusive David Glenn written coverage and his patented journalistic research that is truly second to none. So, DG, when you did this research, how does the success of North Carolina college baseball teams compare over the last two years to 10, 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, there's been a dramatic improvement, Mike, lately in how our state's teams collectively have performed in particular in the NCAA baseball championship. And that's the biggest reason I've been calling this the golden era for college baseball here in North Carolina. For example, one part of my research was going back 25 years. In 1999, the NCAA changed its format for postseason baseball. So that offered a good time frame to judge these results. Just as the NCAA basketball tournament has expanded many times over many decades, the NCAA baseball event has both expanded and changed its format multiple times. So 1999 was this particularly big year because the NCAA baseball postseason field expanded from 48 teams to the current 64 teams. And in the same year, 1999, the NCAA adopted the super regional format for the first time meaning there are these, as we're watching this week, eight best of three series going on around the country in what is basically the Sweet 16 of college baseball. Well, from 1999 through 2016, that's a span of 18 NCAA baseball tournaments, our state produced 16 total super regional squads. That's not a bad number, obviously, but it's an average of slightly less 
than one super regional participant per year. In the same 18-year span, 99 through 2016, our state actually ended up with six years where we had zero teams in the Super Regionals. We were left out entirely of the Sweet 16 in 2000, 2002, 05, 2010, 2014, and 2015. So in those years, basically, college baseball season was completely over for our purposes by the end of the month of May, even though 16 teams from other parts of the country were still playing out the baseball bracket throughout the month of June, all the way to that College World Series in Omaha. Well, that sort of thing, us getting the big sombrero in the month of June, has not happened since. And here's the amazing contrast. After averaging that less than one super regional team per year over 18 years, again, that's us as a state, we've more than doubled our participation in the Sweet 16. So starting in 2017 and continuing through our current year, 2024, the state of North Carolina collectively has averaged slightly more than two super regional teams per year. And there has not been a single tournament played in that stretch without at least two of our teams. That makes things a lot more fun around here in the month of June, doesn't it? Here's the list from this golden era that I'm describing. In 2017, it was both Davidson and Wake Forest. In 2018, it was both Duke and Carolina, and the Heels ended up going to the College World Series that year. 2019, it was Duke and ECU and UNC. So we had three of the Sweet 16 as a state. That is the most in the history of our state. And it's not often equaled or topped by any other state ever. 2020, of course, there was no NCAA tournament because of COVID. But continuing the theme, in 2021, it was both ECU and NC State in the Super Regionals. Wolfpack ended up advancing to Omaha. It was both ECU and UNC in 2022 participating in Super Regionals separately. In 2023, just last year, it was Duke and Wake Forest. So you're seeing, again, a variety of schools, but always multiple schools. The Deeks last year, remember, did advance to Omaha and play in the College World Series. And this year, of course, as we mentioned, it's both the Wolfpack and the Tar Heels. We'll see if either or both of them make it to Omaha this year. As we wish the Pack and the Heels well this week, by the way, the Pack is at Georgia. The Heels are hosting West Virginia. It's worth mentioning that 11 years ago, both State and Carolina made it to the same College World Series. UCLA did end up winning the national championship that year, but the Pack and the Heels actually went head-to-head -head in Omaha against each other twice, with each team winning one of those games uh, back in 2013. So both the Heels and the Pack are still seeking their first NCAA title in baseball, and obviously they're both hoping that this is their year, although, of course, there are 14 other teams right now that are still alive and kicking and probably thinking along the same lines. I am a better person and a more effective business owner for having known and learned from Emily Parks over many years now. Emily's company, Organize for Success, helps multi-passionate business owners and executives bring harmony to all the layers of their lives, from work to side projects, from friends and family to hobbies, community, and beyond. With Emily's help, you too can make every minute matter. She helps you determine what earns your time and how to efficiently accomplish what matters. One of the many things I love about Emily is that she does not impose her will on her clients. She listens to them. That way she can better help them cultivate the lives they want to live. You can set up a complimentary call with Emily today by visiting organizeforsuccess.com. David, looking at NC State's athletics year, boy, the Wolfpack under athletics director, Boo Corrigan, they have been red hot. Cross country national championship in the fall, football bowl game, a men's basketball final four, a women's basketball final four, and now the Wolfpack going on to the super regionals. It has been a red and white year. Now you're wearing your red and white of the Phillies today. You played a lot of baseball back in the Keystone State growing up. And I know you have a deep passion, a strong passion, like we all do, 
for college basketball. What's the biggest difference between the basketball tournament and the baseball tournament? Man, I love that question, and I will give you two things. But quick shout out, since you mentioned it, to NC State as a whole, to Boo Corrigan, as you mentioned, their modern day athletic director. How about also a hat tip to Debbie Yao, the Wolfpack's former athletic director? She hired Dave Doran in football, she hired Wes Moore in women's basketball. Uh, she has been around not quite as long uh, as an Elliott Avent in baseball, for example but she hired Kevin Keats from UNC Wilmington to take the job at NC State. So even in retirement, Debbie Yao has a hand in that success, as of course those coaches and players do, and as Boo Corrigan does as the guy steering the ship as we speak. Quick postscript on that. I wear this jersey today in part because our show is about baseball, in part because one of my favorite Wolfpack legends ever in any sport is the great Chris Corciani, one of the best college basketball point guards ever, uh, who's still a member of our community here in North Carolina and just an all-around great guy. He and I share a love for the Philadelphia Phillies, and of course, we both love to see, uh, in his case, he has a particular passion for the Wolfpack, of course, for obvious reasons. I tend to just be happy when any of our states are doing well, but those two quick shout-outs. I celebrate, as you said, March Madness when it comes to basketball, men's and women's. But as a former baseball player and just an observer and a fan of the baseball tournament at the college level, two things jump out, jump out to me, Mike. And I actually cherish both of these things. I think many other fans do as well. First, the underdogs in baseball actually have a legitimate chance to win the whole darn thing. And I mean the national championship. This is not the case in basketball. The lowest seeded team ever to win the NCAA basketball tournament was Villanova in 1985, and the Wildcats were a number eight seed. Even as a number eight seed, obviously, you're in the top half of a 64 or 68 team bracket. So that means every men's basketball champion ever has come from the top half of the bracket. You don't see nine seeds, 12 seeds, 16 seeds winning the big dance. In baseball, it is true that a lot of the high seeds have been winning lately. I think it's five of the last six national champions in college baseball were top eight seeds, the way the Tar Heels are this year. Top eight seed, remember, comes with that home field advantage in both the opening weekend regional, but also the second weekend, is if you survive that first weekend, the super regional. So five of the last six national champs were top eight seeds, but it's also true that teams have become national champions in college baseball from the bottom half of the bracket. So just two years ago in 2022, Mississippi of the SEC won it all in Omaha after starting the tournament as a number three seed just in the four-team regional. That means the committee thought there were at least 32 teams out of the 64 in the field that had had better regular seasons than what Ole Miss had that year. In 2016, Coastal Carolina had never even played in the NCAA baseball tournament as a university, but the Chanticleers actually won the whole darn thing that year. That was uh, eight years, or yeah, eight years ago. They were not one of the 16 national seeds that year. I believe they were a number two regional seed, which means they were top 32, but again, not top 16. The craziest example of this phenomenon came in 2008 when Fresno State won the college baseball national championship after starting the event as a four seed in the regional. The, the, that's You're the last seed in your own four-team regional to start the tournament. Fresno State, those Bulldogs of 2008, won the whole darn thing that year. There are other examples, but you get the point. In most sports and most college sports included. You can't really compete for a title from the bottom half of the bracket. In college baseball, some of those teams I just mentioned, among others, have proved that it can be done. My other big difference between basketball and baseball here in the college postseason is simply the fact that if you play well enough during the regular season, in baseball, you earn the right to play on your home field maybe even all the way to the College World Series. In basketball, of course, you can earn a high seed. And if you're a number one seed, you get the benefit of a 16 seed in your first game, et cetera. There are advantages of high seeds in other postseason events. 
But I don't know if there's a, an advantage as big as the one in the NCAA baseball championship. Because the thing to remember about baseball's postseason is that getting that top 16 seed, as Carolina and State and ECU did this year, is huge because you get to play the entire first weekend, that four-team double elimination mini bracket we call the NCAA regional, on your home field. Anyone who's ever been to Boschimer Stadium in Chapel Hill, Doak Field in Raleigh, Clark LeClaire Stadium in Greenville knows about the famous fan support in those places and how much those players absolutely love playing in front of those home fans. Pretty much everybody plays better at home, so it's a huge advantage. Of course, you're not allowed to play on your home court in the basketball, the men's basketball uh, postseason event. You not only are allowed, you might play all of your games on your home field until you get to that 18 College World Series in Omaha. Sure enough, this year, the Heels and the Wolfpack both won with the help of that home field advantage last week. The Pirates came very close before falling in their final game to Evansville and Greenville. If you can get the top eight seed, remember, there's the extra bonus. The Tar Heels are the number four national seed this year. If you're top eight and you win on the opening weekend, you're guaranteed to host a Super Regional as long as you advance out of the first round. So that means you play your Sweet 16 matchup, your Super Seasonal seat, super regional matchup on your home field. In Carolina's case this year, it happens to be a best of three series against West Virginia, which is scheduled to begin Friday. Meanwhile, the, the Wolfpack, top 16 seed, but not top eight, has to go on the road and deal with a tough Georgia Bulldogs team on their home field in Athens, Georgia. Just for reference, by the way, the Tar Heels' regular season record at Boschimer Stadium this year was 32 wins and two losses. Let me say that again. They played at home 34 times during the regular season, this year's Tar Heels. They won 32 of those 34 games. That is one heck of a home field advantage. Obviously, high seeds and home field advantage don't guarantee anything. You still have to execute. And the competition is much better than a lot of those teams you probably beat at home during the regular season. But being at home sure can help. And the way college baseball sets up its postseason uh, includes that really big reward if you're a high enough seed. David, you talk about in college baseball, how sometimes and maybe even more so than in March Madness with college basketball, you can see the little engine that could, those small schools, make a rise up and get to Omaha, like you said about Fresno State and them winning the national championship. But one of the big changes coming down the pike is going to be with this house settlement and the demolition of the norms that we all know about college athletics. And when it comes to baseball, they're now going to have the opportunity to maybe not have an unlimited roster, but they definitely will be able to give away full scholarships to everybody on that roster. That means that the talent, much like in college football, much like in college basketball, will start to coagulate and clot around the big schools with the big paydays. And that means that it's going to be tougher for the people that call Brooks Field at UNC Wilmington and Jim Perry Stadium in Bowie's Creek to – make those runs again. And those are great college baseball programs in North Carolina, a great baseball state. Do you think that this type of level of success in North Carolina collegiate baseball, and don't forget Catawba is playing in Cary this week in the Division II College World Series. So Jim Gant and the Catawba Indians getting it done at that level too. Do you think college baseball can sustain this excellence over time as we move forward in this new era? It's a hard question to answer, Mike, because there are so many questions about the future of college sports right now. You know, as a former NCAA athletic director yourself, that if the financial advantages, for example, beyond the issues you just mentioned for those other schools, if the financial advantages of the Big Ten, which is not typically a great baseball conference, but is incredibly wealthy and getting wealthier, and the Southeastern Conference, which is already the best baseball conference in America most years at the college level, if the financial disparities between the Big Ten and the SEC, and let's just say everybody else, not only those smaller leagues, but also the ACC and the Big 12, if those gaps become too extreme in the long run, 
both with university athletic department numbers and name image likeness money, where some of these baseball coaches are already tired of losing their best players to those bigger programs that have more money in the bank, as you mentioned. It'll, it'll not only be difficult for those mid-majors, if you will, to sustain their excellent, it's going to be difficult potentially at some point for Big 12 and ACC teams to keep up their stadiums and their recruiting budgets and their travel budgets and how much you spend on scholarships in baseball once those rules change. Uh, but all of those issues, of course, apply to all sports on all of these campuses because of the house settlement and name image likeness money and this somewhat unpredictable future model for college sports. Whereas that piece of the puzzle is somewhat unpredictable, for now, I'll just stick to what we do know with clarity because that house settlement is going to need a year probably to shake out. And that is that the state of North Carolina has a lot of really good college baseball coaches right now. So that's the good news, right? You need players and you need coaches always. Fans could do their own research. And of course, we've already talked about some of the great players on some of the great teams in our league. I'll leave the players off to the side, at least for purposes of this discussion. But UNC's head coach right now, Scott Forbes, is four for four on NCAA tournament bids as a relatively new head coach who was recently named the ACC Coach of the Year. And he was also an assistant coach with the Tar Heels on seven different teams that advanced to the College World Series under the legendary Carolina coach Mike Fox, who's probably the best baseball coach in the history of our state uh, at the college level. And a guy who, by the way, really did help energize this golden era of college baseball in the state of North Carolina that we're talking about today. NC State's head coach, Elliot Avent, has also played a huge role in this. He's obviously a living legend closer to the end of his career. He's taken the Wolfpack to 21 NCAA tournaments, and he took the pack famously all the way to the College World Series twice in 2013 and 2021 at ECU. Cliff Godwin has taken the Pirates to the NCAA tournament all but one year in his tenure when they actually held a tournament. Obviously, 2020, there was no tournament because of COVID. But Coach Godwin is essentially eight out of nine, I think it is, in now a full decade as the Pirates head coach. So you have to keep them in Greenville. But that is one of the most successful programs outside the so-called power conferences in college baseball. At Duke, Chris Pollard has led the Duke Blue Devils to regular NCAA tournament trips and two of the last four ACC titles, and that is at a school, Duke University, that I'm not exaggerating here, did almost nothing of significance, seriously, for about 50 years in the sport of baseball, from the 1960s until around 2016, when the Devils that year under Coach Pollard ended a 55-year NCAA tournament drought. They had not been to the postseason in that long. Coach Pollard has turned the Blue Devils around in more ways than we can count. UNC Wilmington has been consistently outstanding under Coach Randy Hood, who was also a part of the Seahawks' great success as an assistant prior to becoming the head man. And, he's, and that's probably the best baseball program in the Coastal Athletic Association. Campbell was not in the tournament this year, but the Camels have been consistently strong under their head coach, Justin Hare, for quite a while now. High Point, as we mentioned, just broke through with that big South title and the first NCAA tournament bid in the history of their program. The Charlotte 49ers, led by former UNC pitcher Robert Woodard, are another good program in our state. They played in the big bracket in both 2021 and 2023. That's a lot of quality. That's a lot of depth. And it's been a lot of fun over this last decade or so, especially to see very high level college baseball become an even bigger part, thanks to those men in large part of our state's incredibly awesome sports culture. We're celebrating the fact that college baseball wasn't always a part of that amazing sports culture across North Carolina, but there is no arguing the fact that it is now. Whether you are moving locally, nationally, or even internationally, and whether you're a residential or commercial customer, please consider our friends at XL Moving and Storage, an award-winning Allied Van Lines agent with offices in Greensboro and Raleigh. Thanks to their 25 years of experience helping North Carolinians all across the state with their moving and storage needs, 
XL has become the trusted hometown North Carolina moving services company. Our good friends Jim Dorsett and Jody Hatley, along with their hardworking staff, offer customized, tailored relocation and storage solutions to the people of North Carolina and beyond. Visit them online today at xlms.com. That's E-X-C-E-L-M-S dot com. David, growing up in the state, I remember the big thing in the summertime was American Legion mm. baseball. I mean, we're talking 1,500, 2,000 fans a game when you would have teams from Lenore and Hickory going at it. So when you talk about homegrown North Carolina talent, this is a baseball state. It makes Tom Dundon's pursuit of Major League Baseball for the Triangle even more truly relevant because this state loves its baseball. But this state is known for basketball because North Carolina, Duke, NC State, all of these programs have won national championships. You've had Division II, Division III, strong programs, as we mentioned, over the years. What's it going to take for either NC State or North Carolina to finally get over the hump and bring back a College World Series championship? Your bottom line is right here. The only major blemish on our state's college baseball resume collectively is th that it's been a long, 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 long time since anybody around here won the College World Series. Uh, for some, just getting to the College World Series, by the way, is a more immediate hurdle. In the history of the NCAA baseball tournament, which dates all the way to 1947, the school with the most NCAA tournament bids without ever getting to the College World Series is right here in our backyard. It's East Carolina. The Pirates have played in the baseball postseason 34 times, but they have never made it to Omaha, the final eight, much less won a College World Series title. So that's obviously a door that Cliff Godwin and the boys in Greenville want to eventually kick down. But in the bigger picture, yes, it does seem odd that despite all this college baseball success that we were, we're celebrating for, the, for a lot of teams, a pretty nice variety of teams in our state at the college level, we have collectively produced since 1947 exactly one NCAA Division I baseball champion. And that's obviously in stark contrast to men's basketball where we have 13, Carolina with six, Duke with five, NC State with two. There's only a dozen or so teams in men's basketball that have multiple NCAA champions. And three of those are right here in our backyard, located within 30 minutes or so of each other by car. It's just a, a crazy accomplishment at men's basketball. And it starts with those NCAA titles, multiple at multiple schools that call North Carolina home. The one and only North Carolina-based team ever to win the College World Series was Wake Forest University. And the Deacons did so way back in 1955. You and I weren't even alive yet. That was so long ago that the Atlantic Coast Conference, which is now a 71-year-old league, had existed for only two years at the time the Deeks won it all. And this is another stunning sign. I'll make this story very short. But it's a stunning sign from those dramatically different times. The Demon Deacons head baseball coach, was a 47-year-old man named Taylor Sanford in 1955. The year after the Deacons won the national championship, the this, this season immediately after, it was so they win it all in the late spring or summer of 1955. I don't know where the event was on the calendar back then. But you're the, you're the national championship baseball coach of the Wake Forest Demon Deacons in 1955, spring or summer. In January of the following year, January 1956, 47-year-old Taylor Sanford resigned from Wake Forest at midseason, citing money matters and feelings of job insecurity, and he never coached college baseball again. That is another reminder of how much the world has changed, how much college sports has changed, how much college baseball has changed. You can have a million dollar a year college baseball coach nowadays. That's an awful lot of change over these, what is it, 69 years now? Does that math add up? 69 years 
since anyone in our state won that one and only College World Series championship. It certainly would be fun to see either the Tar Heels or the Wolfpack capture that ultimate college baseball prize here almost seven full decades later. We'll see. Uh, but like ECU kicking on that door, but not, not quite knocking it down in terms of appearing in the College World Series, we've had a bunch of teams get there. Carolina's been there 11 times. State's been to the College World Series three times, twice under Elliott Avent. Duke's been to the College World Series three times, just not since 1961. And Wake's been to the College World Series three times, including last year under Tom Walter, their current head coach. Uh, but there's only that one NCAA title, at least for now. The great news that we've discussed over these last 30 minutes or so suggests uh, that maybe that equation is going to change, if not this year, then sometime very soon. So if it's the Tar Heels and the Wolfpack playing for a College World Series championship, does that supersede Carolina and Duke at the Final Four in 2022 in the semifinal? I mean, can you imagine these two fan bases squaring off for a national championship in what I think you've done a really great job of outlining could be the official sport of the state of North Carolina, and we're talking baseball. Yeah, well, remember, they weren't the last two teams standing when both the Wolfpack and the Tar Heels were together in Omaha in 2013, just 11 years ago. So that was Elliott Avent's Wolfpack. That was Mike Fox's Tar Heels back in 2013. Uh, they were both there. Uh, and I remember these sorts of conversations. I don't think base. I don't think it can supersede that Duke Carolina semifinal matchup, unless maybe, maybe it unfolded such that in 2013, the Wolfpack beat the Tar Heels once. The Tar Heels beat the Wolfpack once, and they ended up contributing to the elimination of each other. Uh, but they weren't in the final two the way that College World Series bracket plays out. Uh, you're right. A couple of those Mike Fox teams were in the final two of the eight that start in Omaha in the College World Series. That's as close as you can get. If it were the Wolfpack and the Heels both making it to Omaha this year and then somehow working their way through the bracket so they're the last two standing, I mean, that's the championship game, right? Uh, I guess that would be the semifinal matchup between the Tar Heels and the Blue Devils, uh, but, got this, but the stage is not quite as big as you know, the tens of millions who were watching the Tar Heels beat the Blue Devils uh, in, the, in the final four of the men's basketball tournament just a few years ago. It's going to be a lot of fun to see how it all plays out. The Tar Heels in West Virginia this weekend at the Bosch. And down in Athens, it'll be the Wolfpack and the Georgia Bulldogs with a little added intrigue there because it's an ACC SEC matchup, and that always has some subplot to it that gets juicy, especially on the Twitter machine. So we'll have a lot of fun watching that. David Glenn, great to talk to you as always. We'll see you next week right here on the North Carolina Sports Network. Thanks, Mike. Always great to be with you, especially fun to be talking baseball, one of the, my lifelong loves in this big sports world that you and I both enjoy.